Americans today think of the early 19th century, they may be dimly aware of the industrial north and the growing cities. They probably are aware of the plantation south and the system of slavery. But the section of the country that really captures their imagination is the West. The same section that captured the imagination of artists and writers at the time. Now, when you say the West, what are you talking about? It depends on what year. In 1770, the West, to Daniel Boone, meant Kentucky and Tennessee. By the 1820s, to the Lincolns, it meant Illinois. By 1850, it meant the Pacific Coast. As Americans filled up the continent, they saw themselves as fulfilling some sort of a divine plan a divine plan that said the United States should expand to the Pacific. It was what they called their manifest destiny. The father of the universe set aside the American continent for the free development of our multiplying millions. It was God's plan. If the Indians had to be exterminated, so be it. If land had to be taken from another country, so be it. The United States was going to expand, in their mind, it was God's plan. Now, whether that plan was made on earth or in heaven is debatable. The fact that expansion took place is not debatable. In 1800, the United States occupied the area east of the Mississippi River. In 1803, we added the Louisiana Purchase from France. In 1819, Florida was acquired from Spain. In 1845, Texas became a state. As a result of a treaty with Great Britain, we got Oregon in 1846. In 1848, after one of the most blatantly aggressive wars in our history, we acquired the Mexican Cession, the southwestern part of the United States and California. In 1853, we purchased a little bit of southern Arizona and New Mexico for a railroad route. And our territory to the Pacific was complete. What was the lure that brought people to the West? I mean, life out here could be pretty rough. A few people lived in the scattered forts throughout the mountain regions, but many lived in hastily built shanties. They were poorly fed, illy clad. Why did they come? In part, it was hard times in the East. There had been some depressions. Some were fed up with the crowded industrial towns. But the West had an appeal of its own. It might be adventure, a new world to conquer. But for others, it was profit. Profit was to be had. Adventure would come later. Profit in furs. Furs had appealed to people sincerely French. In the West, there was a lucrative trade with beaver pelts. This is where you get the so-called mountain men climbing and crawling and mapping the western part of the United States. The mountaineer is a puzzle hard to solve. He was from many different walks of life. Some were sons of farmers, some were freed slaves, others were themselves Eastern Indians, Delawares, Iroquois, Shawnee. Uh, others were sons of the old pioneer stock from the Southern Highlands, the Scots-Irish. And uh, they defy definition. They were not all of them uh, unlettered bumpkins. A lot of them had some education. Some were uh, highly educated, and many of them had a very highly developed sense of honor. During the period from 1825 to 1840, these mountain men usually met with traders once each summer at a pre-appointed place somewhere in the region of Colorado, Utah, or Wyoming. Such a meeting was called a rendezvous. And at a rendezvous, which might last from one to three weeks, the trapper would trade beaver pelts and other furs for shirts, buttons, guns, gun parts, powder, traps, coffee, sugar, anything that they needed to survive another year or hadn't had for a while. Often including whiskey. These rendezvous were a chance to get together, to see some of your friends, to kind of count noses and see who didn't make it through the winter. And the trapping business did have a very high mortality rate. Uh, very, very often the fellows just didn't show up at the rendezvous.
This is Bent's Fort on the Arkansas River in southern Colorado. It was constructed by 1833 as a fort along one of the branches of the Santa Fe Trail. An adobe structure of some 26 apartments. At one time, it was the only structure of any size between Missouri and Santa Fe. Wagon trains could come in here, trappers, traders. There were corrals. There were blacksmiths, gunsmiths, wheelwrights, cooks, living quarters, whatever you needed to survive in the West. Ben's Fort played a very significant role, not in military operations, but in the trade between the United States and Mexico along the Santa Fe Trail. The trade goods coming from Mexico primarily were silver coins, eight real pieces, which were legal tender into the 1850s in the United States. Those coins, which started to come in in the 1820s, became very important in helping America get through some tough economic times. Also from Mexico came the uh, Missouri mule, which originally started out in Chihuahua, Mexico, and blankets and also raw wool and cotton. From the Indians came the buffalo robes, which were usually tanned by the Indian women. These were used as sleigh robes, lap robes, and bedspreads back in the East, but had a very important use as industrial belting in the machinery in the mills in New England, and also saw heavy use as bedding for slaves in the South. Trade wasn't the only reason people were interested in moving West. It wasn't even the main reason. Many people came for the possibility of getting free land. That certainly was the case with Texas. Stephen and Moses Austin had convinced the government of Mexico that they should give free land grants to Americans who were willing to settle in Texas. And Americans took him up on it by the thousands. Land was also the big interest in Oregon. Except for some early fur trappers, missionaries were the first people to go into Oregon. And those missionaries wrote back east the so-called Oregon Letters. And in those letters, they described the plentiful crops and the fertile soil of Oregon. And Americans by the thousands began heading to the Northwest. Leaving from Independence, Missouri, they went across Nebraska following the Platte River on the Oregon Trail, across Wyoming, and on into the Northwest. So you have trade and you have land. One group came for land and for religious reasons. Those were the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commonly called Mormons, who settled in Utah beginning in 1847. They had been persecuted in the East for their beliefs. Their leader, Joseph Smith, had been murdered. So they picked up, and under the charismatic leadership of Brigham Young, they headed west. And in Utah, they started one of the most successful economic cooperative communities in history. They went to Utah to get away from the United States. They arrived in Utah just in time to find that that area had been annexed. So you have trade as a factor, you have land, you have religion. In California, you find a fourth reason. Americans had always been interested in California. Its good harbor seemed like an ideal place for trading with the Far East. But after 1849, California became synonymous with gold. On January the 24th, 1848, James Marshall found gold on the land of John Sutter. Sutter wrote in his diary, this day some kind of metal has been found that looked like gold. He tried to keep it a secret. He didn't want thousands of people forming a gold rush plowing through his lands where he was growing grapes and raising cattle. But you don't keep a secret like that. People began swarming into California. It was the gold rush of 1849, and they were the famous 49ers. It was easy to get to the gold. In many cases, you could pan it. You simply slosh water around in a pan, the heavy gold settle to the bottom. Sometimes all you needed was a pick and a shovel. People dropped what they were doing in the east and they headed for California. They were going to get rich and they came singing, Oh Susanna. Oh Susanna, don't you cry for me. I come from Alabama with banjo on my knee.
The excitement produced was intense, and many were soon busy in the hasty preparations for departure. The family who kept house for me caught the moving fever. Husband and wife were both packing up. The blacksmith dropped his hammer, the carpenter his plane, the mason his trowel, the farmer his sickle, the baker his loaf, and the barkeep his bottle. All were off for the mines, some on horses, some in carts, some on crutches, and one in a litter. They traveled any way they could get there. Cartoonists had a fine time depicting the 49ers. San Francisco grew from a town of a few hundred to a city of 40,000. It grew and burned and grew again. Rent was $1,000 a month, eggs $10 a dozen. But it didn't make any difference. Everybody expected to be rich. Looking at the ghost towns of the western mountains today, it's hard to imagine what they were like in their prime. In those mining camps named Poker Flats, Hang Town, Whiskey Bar, Hell's Delight, Skunk Gulch, Dead Dog, and the like, were some of the most colorful desperados gathered in one spot. Missouri farmers, Yankee sailors, English shopkeepers, French peasants, Mexican peons, the heathen Chinese, and a liberal sprinkling of assassins from hell. Men went armed as a matter of course. Shootings were seldom investigated. What law and order there was was enforced by groups of citizens who banded together and formed vigilante groups. Groups which operated under the theory that you should give a man a fair trial and then hang him. Westward expansion brought up a bigger problem than that of mere frontier justice. It raised a problem that would threaten the very existence of the nation. You see, it raised the question of would the new Western territories be slave or would they be free? President Taylor said he saw no connection between the new West and slavery. But President Taylor was wrong. Northerners moving to the West came from free states and expected to live in free territories. Southerners expected to bring their slaves with them. Now, how do you resolve that conflict? Will it lead to war? Alexander Stevens of Georgia said, I tell you the prospect ahead is dark and cloudy, is thick and gloomy. But in 1850, other Americans saw it differently. The future was bright. America had expanded to the Pacific. Americans had fulfilled their manifest destiny.